Uh, if he does, I'm not aware of it. Yes. Um, you know, I'm so familiar with uh, decisions in Iraq. Yes. They're, well, historically, that's the way we did. Uh, yeah, are, are there, are there, are there, are there, what's the last decision in Europe? Because that's all, that's all you got until the RNB so. You might say, well, any time it stops running, it's sleeping. Uh, but uh, the, the difference that I'm going to make is, uh, will become evident when I talk about uh, turnstiles versus sleep cues. OK. So with these short-lived short locks, or mute, uh, they're, they're essentially mutexes, we have uh, what's called a blocking mutex. And a blocking mutex is one that'll spin for a while, and then if it can't get the resource, it'll block on a turnstile. The key thing about all of these things that are using mutexes is that they can always run if it's either, I mean, the only reason they don't run is either that a CPU is not available or they're waiting for a mutex that some other process can, is holding and it, you know, that process will either give it up because they're running or if they're not running, as soon as they get scheduled and they run, then they will release it and so eventually we can get there. The difference between that sort of an activity and the ones down here with the sleep cues are sleep cues are something where you need to wait for something to happen. Like you're waiting for the disk to deliver a block. And simply scheduling you to run is not going to make you give up the lock. With mutexes, scheduling you to run or the uh, scheduling some other mutex holding threads to run uh, will cause you to be able to make forward progress. Okay. So besides blocking mutexes, we have these things called pull mutexes, uh, which are general use uh, blocking mutexes. We have reader-writer locks, which are uh, mutexes that have shared exclusive semantics. These are exclusive use only. And we have read mostly locks, which give you fast access for things that are read mostly. And as I said, I'm going to come back and look at each of these in detail. We then have locks that use the sleep queue interface. And the sleep queue interface, uh, again, is for longer term sleeps, typically waiting for something that requires some outside stimulus. So you're waiting for a packet to arrive on the network. You're waiting for a block to arrive on a, uh, from a disk. You are waiting for the user to type something. Uh, so it can be potentially a fairly long time before uh, these will uh, come back. OK, so we have shared exclusive locks. These are sort of the fastest and simplest of the sleep locks. We have condition variables, which is really just sort of a wrapper around the traditional sleep and wake up that I described earlier. Uh, and then we have the all singing, all dancing, lock manager, full functionality sleep locks with the commensurate high overhead of using them because they do a lot of stuff. And then finally, we have the witness subsystem uh, and uh, it is, as we'll see, the thing that sort of makes sure that you don't violate a lot of these rules that I'm going to talk about uh, as we go through these different locks. OK, so I'm going to put these slides up on the, the wiki page. So if you want to get them later, you can do that. Um, this is the place to refer to uh, if you want to uh, you know, sort of get the executive summary. All right. so. The first thing I want to do is to look at the data structures that we use for managing these locks. Turnstiles are the things that are used by the short-term mutexes. And uh, as it says, the, the blocking mutexes, the reader writers, and the read mostly locks. And these are designed, these mutexes are designed for holding just for a short period of time, usually just tens of instructions. So you're, you need to you know, check a value and take some sort of action on it, or you need to insert something on a list, or you need to take something off a list, or you need to traverse a list and you don't want it to change, you know, you don't want to have someone pulling stuff out from underneath you while you're trying to traverse the list. So you do, it, you do an operation, you give it up. 
Uh, and, and in the code, you'll typically see that you acquire the mutex, you do a few lines of C code, and then you typically give it up. Okay, so it's used to protect both read and write access to data structures. Uh, a lot of people make the mistake of forgetting that they need to check, that they need to protect uh, for read access. So if you're going to traverse a list, even though you're not going to change it, you still need to hold the mutex so that you, things don't get pulled out from underneath you. Okay, you are not allowed to own a turnstile lock when you request a long-term sleep type lock. That is just a no-no. One of the things that the witness code will check for if you try and acquire a, a sleep lock and you're about to go to sleep while you hold a mutex, then it will panic and complain and whine and moan. Okay, one of the things that we do is that we track the current lock holder. So whenever a lock is held, we know who holds that lock. And the reason that we need to do that is so that we can do what's called priority propagation. Uh, the issue with priority propa propagation is that you may have some relatively low priority thread that comes along and gets a mutex and then gets blocked because some higher priority thread comes along that, that gets the CPU. And now some really high priority important thread comes along and they need the mutex that's held by this low priority thread. But the low priority thread can't run because there's these higher priority things that all have all the CPUs. And so the idea of priority propagation is that when this high priority thread comes along and it sees that this lock that it needs, this mutex that it needs, is held by this low priority thread, it temporarily gives its high priority to that low priority thread. So that low priority thread goes right up in the queue. All of a sudden, it's high priority. It gets to run. It releases the mutex. And then we don't love it anymore. And down it goes. And now we get the, the CPU get handed back to us. The mutex is available. And zoom off we go. So that's the notion of priority propagation. In order to be able to do that, we need to know who holds the mutex. OK. so. The turnstile implementation is the thing that does this. And uh, so the, there's a bunch of different things that we need to be able to do. We need a hash header so that we can quickly find the turnstile that is the, the, the data structure that essentially keeps track of everything that's going on. So just to zip ahead of here a little bit, this is a picture of the turnstile data structure. And you can see here we have the hash header across the top. And so we're hashing based on a particular lock that we're interested in. And so it, let's say that we're interested here in lock 18. So the, we'd run down this hashing header. We would find this entry here, which, yes, that's for lock 18. And now we can see we have the owner of the lock at the moment is thread number one here. Uh, waiting for it, we have threads number two and three. And uh, then also from this thread one, we have a list of all of the mutexes that it currently holds. So it's currently holding uh, lock 18 here and lock 15. All right, so let's just back up again here. So the hash header allows us to quickly find the lock turnstile. So we hash, we find that turnstile. It in turn points to the thread that holds the lock. And it gives us also the list of any threads that are waiting for that lock. Okay, now a turnstile, one of those entries, one of these entries here, is needed each time that a thread blocks. So any time that you block, we need to have that turnstile so we can have that data structure which says, all right, that's who owns it and you're waiting, uh, and, and potentially others. Now, remember that these mutexes are things that are only held for very short periods of time. The last thing in the world we want to do is to go off and max one of those out those things. Uh, I mean, we're taking something that you know is going to be held for ten instructions. We're going to go off and do several thousand instructions to malloc something to keep track of that. I don't think so. So how are we going to deal with this? Well, a thread can only block on one thing at a time. You can hold a bunch of locks, but you can only block on one because when you're blocked, you're not going anywhere. So. Uh, what happens is that when you create a thread, one of the things that we do is we also, at the same time, malloc a turnstile for you. And that's your turnstile. And so when you show up, sashay up to the mutex, and you try and get it, 
If it's already held, then we take the turnstile, that your turnstile, and that's the one that we use here. Okay, so this thread came along. It got the mutex. No, nobody's waiting, so everything's fine. This doesn't yet exist. Now thread two comes along. Thread two is blocked, and so we take this turnstile, which was allocated by thread two here, and set this up and link it all in, as you see here. And now along comes thread three that also wants to, this mutex, and it also has a turnstile that it turns over, and we don't need it because we've already got this here. And so I'm not shown in this picture, but it ought to be here as a little link list off of the, the turnstile in use of all the other turnstiles that have been turned in in the meantime. And now let's suppose that thread two is the next one. You know, thread one gives it up. Thread two now is the next one we select to run, presumably because it's higher priority than thread three. And so when, when we wake up thread two, of course, we have to give thread two back thread two's turnstile, but this turnstile is still in use because of thread three here. But luckily, thread three had given us their turnstile, so we just give thread three's turnstile to thread two, and off thread two goes with a turnstile, and they're happy, and it's not the same one you gave us, but you know, who cares? And then when thread three finally gets to run, now we don't need the turnstile here anymore at all, so we delink it from this structure, we hand it to thread three, and thread three goes running off with it. Yes? Uh, it would not work on loosely coupled. We're assuming we're in a tightly coupled multiprocessor here. Otherwise, no, that would potentially not work well. Okay. Um, all right. So this is, that's essentially this point. You provide a turnstile when you show up. When you're awakened, you're given a turnstile, not necessarily the one you gave us, but it's a turnstile. Okay, and that's here where the unrelated turnstiles are saved in return as threads awaken. Okay, if the whole variable lock has a lower priority than the thread that's about to be blocked, then we recursively propagate the higher priority to the holder, but only until such time as it releases it. So again, if we uh, look at this picture here, uh, thread, let's say thread three comes along and is blocked by thread one because thread one holds the mutex at this point. But if thread one has a lower priority than thread three, then we will give thread three's priority to thread one until such time as thread one gives up the mutex that we want. And when it does, then thread one's priority will be pushed back down, and in all likelihood, thread three will then get to run, and away it goes. So that's how we implement the priority. Yes? John's the one that implemented this stuff, so <laughs> he's the final <laughs> authority on these things. <laughs> All right. So sleep cues. Um, sleep cues look a lot like turnstiles, except that. Uh, there's certain properties that, that turnstiles have that these don't and vice versa. Uh, so these are used by the shared exclusive locks, the condition variables, and the lock manager locks, that sort of second big block that I told you. These are the ones that are doing long-term sleeps, uh, typically waiting for I.O. events, user input. You know, how long is it going to take for user input to occur? You know, they might have had a heart attack. They never type again. Who knows? <laughs> uh, there is no priority propagation because unlike turnstiles, you, these, these things can't run until whatever the event is happens. Just, you know, I can give you the highest priority in the entire system. If the disk block hasn't been delivered yet, you can't run, and you can't give up the lock until the data arrives, because that's the meaning of having that lock. So we don't need all the stuff having to do with priority propagation, because it's just not a, a sensible thing to do. Uh, you're not allowed to own a turnstile lock when you request a sleep queue lock. And that gets back to this whole business of the, the, with, with the turnstile locks, these are things where we can always get that lock if we just get you or recursively the, the things that are blocking you to run. And we can always get them to run because the only reason that they haven't run is because they haven't had a high enough priority to be allowed to run. 
so if you were to hold a turnstile type of lock here, now we wouldn't be able to get that back because just making you run isn't going to solve the problem. And so uh, it is not permitted to own any kind of a turnstile type of lock when you acquire one of these longer term locks. Okay. Now, remember in the previous data structure, we kept track of who held the lock, and we still have that available. So we can track who is the exclusive lock holder, uh, but of course, it doesn't have the, the, the wherewithal to deal with who the, uh, if you have multiple uh, shared lock holders, uh, then that data structure, as it's shown previously, uh, doesn't have the ability to deal with that. Uh, we do have the ability to track the shared lock holders, but I'll talk about that when we get to that point. Okay, uh, these locks may be recursive. Uh, and the decision on whether it's recursive is decided by whoever sets up the lock in the first place. There is, uh, when you create it, you can say this lock is allowed to be recursive. What do I mean by recursive? Uh, what I mean is that if you already hold the lock, you're allowed to get another, you can say I want it ex locked exclusively again, and you'll be able to get that. If it's not set up for recursion, then you'll get a panic saying recursing on a lock that's not recursive. But if it is recursive, then it'll just dutifully give you uh, another exclusive reference. Uh, and is that what? What's the guideline for the recursive lock? Yeah, if you hold it, if you. Uh, I'm going to speak to some of these things, so wait till I go through the locks, because I think I'll answer a lot of those questions for you. Which, by the way, is what we're about to do. <laughs> okay, so just out of left field, I'll just throw in critical sections, which I haven't said boo about yet. Um, these are, in some sense, a locking mechanism. Uh, a critical section uh, is bounded by critical enter and critical exit. And while you are inside one of these critical sections, the thread can't be preempted by another thread. So it cannot be thrown off the, the CPU. And it, in fact, can't even be migrated to another CPU. We can't say, well, you know, we're not really preempting you. We're just moving it from here to there. Uh, and no, can't do that. So critical sections are a lot like the old single-threaded kernel where you'd, you'd black out interrupts, essentially, to prevent yourself from being, uh, well, descheduled. Um, these are useful for per CPU data structures. So for example, there's typically a run queue per CPU. And uh, if you're going to manipulate that, uh, really, you can just, uh, you know, since that data structure is only going to ever be referenced from that CPU, uh, putting a critical enter and exit around the part where you're going to manipulate the queue is sufficient to protect it. Uh, and that way, you don't have to have some kind of mutex, which is uh, potentially going to conflict with other things. Uh, there's also some CPU-specific memory allocation structures. So if you have memory allocated per CPU, uh, again, you can, it allows you to manipulate that. But it does not, and I emphasize, does not protect system-wide data structures. Uh, so this is useful only in that very constrained context. OK, so the hardware requirement is the test and set, as I've already described. Uh, FreeBSD actually uses compare and swap. Uh, the compare and swap, you basically say, compare this value with what's at that location. And uh, then if they match, then you stick this in there. OK, so the, the, what this actually boils down to uh, is we have an owner field for the lock. And if nobody owns it, it has this stint, this uh, stock value, uh, mutex unowned is stored in there. And if the lock is held, then we have a pointer to the thread structure of whoever holds that lock. So to, uh, to, to essentially try and get the lock, what we do is we compare the lock owner field with mutex unowned. And if that's the value that's in there, then we store in 
uh, atomically store in the pointer to the acquiring thread. And then what we do is the return value is what was, was there previously. So if uh, the, it, you look at what came back, and if what came back was mutex unknown, then you know you got it. And if what came back is a pointer to a thread that's not you, then you didn't get it. OK, so uh, that's you know, sort of at the bottom level, that's the, the, the mechanism that we're using. Uh, and then when you're done with it, you just store mutex unknown plop back in there, and now it's, it's unlocked. Now, you may need to check and see if there were others that wanted it, et cetera, uh, but we'll get to that. OK, so starting at the very bottom, we've got the spin mutexes. These are exclusive access only. They just sit there spinning, waiting for the mutex to be available. Once it acquires the mutex, uh, it's in a critical section. Uh, and so it can't be preempted until it gives that thing up. Uh, this is to avoid some de possible deadlocks. Uh, it's actually more expensive to obtain than a blocking mutex. And so it's really only used for very low level scheduling stuff and a little bit of the context switching stuff. Unless you happen to be working in that one little area, you're not going to be using spin mutexes. You're going to be using the regular blocking mutexes, uh, which are what I'm about to describe here. Yes? That statement of more expensive, how much proof have we got of that? Uh, I asked John, and he said they were more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Right, let's, let's, let me do my talk, and we can have this debate <laughs> later. <laughs> Go on, you can have the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> OK, so the blocking mutexes actually use what's called adaptive spinning. So in some sense, we get the benefits of the spinning without necessarily uh, having some of the other uh, drawbacks to it. Uh, so what do I mean by uh, adaptive spinning? Well, we will spin waiting for it only if the owner of the lock is currently running. So if the, the owner of the lock is currently running, the expectation is, well, I haven't got much further to go, and then they're going to be done, and then we'll get it. So we just sit there waiting for it to happen. On the other hand, if they're not running, then uh, it, it behooves us to block, because it potentially it's going to be a while before we're going to be able to get it. And it also means that if we're at a higher priority, it's going to propagate our priority to that uh, particular uh, thread. And hopefully that will boost it up and get it to run and get it to give it up so we can get it back. OK. When, the, when someone is done with the lock or with the mutex, all the waiters are awakened. And again, this might seem counterproductive because you're sort of your first thought is, well, great, we wake up three things, they all dive in, one of them gets it, and the others go back to sleep. And that doesn't seem like a particularly effective way to do things. But it is cheaper to release an uncontested lock since it's just a store. You just drop something in there. We don't have to find the turnstile and traverse it and do lots of other things. So we do that once when the first thread gives it up, and now all of those things get done, and the, the turnstiles get turned back to their owners, et cetera. And uh, we often end up just scheduling those things sequentially anyway, uh, because they're all at the same priority, and we just sort of drop them off. Uh, and even when they are scheduled concurrently, the one who actually has it is probably running, and so they're just going to use adaptive spinning anyway. They're not just going to immediately block. They're going to say, oh, we're not running. I'll just wait for it, and then boom, they, you'll eventually get it. Uh, and so again, it's somewhat counterintuitive why you would wake them all up, but when you actually look at what happens, it's actually a more sensible way to do it. OK. Now, mutexes, when you want to create them, you have to go off and you know, allocate them and initialize them. And if the witness is running, they get registered with the witness code. And conversely, when you're done with them, you've got to essentially shut them back down, deallocate them, and 
deregister them from the witness code, et cetera. And this is a, you know, not a lot of work, but it's not a trivial amount of work. And so if you have something where you need a mutex that's just a, for something that's a very short-lived data structure, the whole overhead of creating and tearing down the mutex can dominate the, the, the cost of, of using that data structure. And so for such things, there is a pool of pre-allocated mutexes. And so when you need a mutex, instead of going through the whole creation business, you just go over and say, I need a mutex. And you sort of check it out, like you know, check, checking a book out of the library. You don't actually have that whole mutex in your data structure. It's just a pointer over to that one that's allocated over there in the pool. And uh, so why would you use something like this? Well, the pull system call is, a, is one of the classic places where it gets used. It needs a structure to track a pull request from the time that you do the pull or the select system call until the arrival of data for one of the pull descriptors, and then we're done with it. And you know, if we've got like high bandwidth uh, networking coming in and you're just selecting on that, you know, it could be a very short period of time between when you go in and, and the select returns. And you know, all we really need it for is to protect a couple little flag fields or something that's in that data structure. The data structure is, you know, maybe four or five pointers long. And so, you know, putting a whole mutex in there would quadruple the size of it, and the whole overhead of doing that for every descriptor that you're polling uh, would be prohibitive. So it's just way quicker to just say, you know, grab a set of these pull things, use them for, you know, one setting and clearing of a flag, give them back, uh, and we're done. So it keeps the structure small, makes it all go quickly. All right, next up the, uh, the ladder come reader-writer locks. And mutexes, as I said earlier, are this exclusive access, uh, but now we want to also be able to do shared semantics so that we can have multiple readers and, and single-threaded writers. Uh, we use, since we're using it, uh, or, yeah, because these are you know, turnstile type, mutex type locks, again, you're not allowed to hold a reader-writer lock when you're going to go to sleep, when you're going to acquire a long-term lock. Uh, we provide priority propagation for the exclusive access, because that's just what turnstiles do. Um, we do not provide priority propagation uh, for the shared access, in this case. Uh, so uh, if you are, uh, you know, there's a bunch of readers, and a writer comes along, and the writer has a higher priority, well, it still has to wait for all the readers to go to give up. Uh, but we don't have any way of knowing who they are, so we can propagate the priority to it. Uh, consequently, uh, if that's going to be an issue for you, you use, need to use some other mechanism. Uh, we also, in this case, allow you to uh, specify that it's okay to recurse. Normally on mutexes, if you recurse, that's a no-no. Uh, this recursion, of course, is referring to the exclusive access. Finally, in this class, we have the read mostly locks. And uh, this is, has pretty much the same property as the reader writer locks, except that they add priority propagation for the shared access. So if you need to have the priority propagation, uh, we can do that here. Uh, and the way we do that is that the shared owners uh, provide a tracking data structure. So much like you provide a turn style when you're blocking, if in this case you have to provide a little data structure that we can then link together in a big long list so we now know who all the readers are. And so now we can do priority propagation because we can just run down that list. So uh, when, you, when you call in to do a, a shared access lock, you also have to pass in a pointer to this tracking data structure. So if it's an issue where you need to have the priority propagation, then you're going to use these kind of locks. Now, the, the notion of this is they're really designed for fast access for readers, so shared access, assuming that there will be relatively few writers. And uh, again, the idea is, uh, so if you have it, you're mostly just reading uh, and you're not going to be writing it very often, then we'd like to have sort of a fast path for read. Uh, so, in essence, what we do is we read without a lock and then see if any bad stuff happened. And if it did, then we have to back up and do the whole thing the hard way. Uh, the routing table is a good example of a read mostly data structure. Uh, so, for example, uh, we don't actually add new routes very often. We mostly just look them up. And so uh, the lookups of that go quickly. When you do an update to the routing table, of course, then 
uh, you get a big burp. So if you use one of these in an instance where you have a lot of writing going on, uh, it's not going to, it's going to be inefficient. Now the best way to implement this uh, is actually uh, patented by IBM. Uh, RCU is the magic word there. Um, now IBM allows anyone with GPL code to use their patented implementation at no cost, i.e. Linux meets this criterion. But FreeBSD is not GPL, so we would have to use a somewhat slower technique to avoid doing the patented way of things. And uh, there was at least one approach to, what? No, no, not for a while. Uh, there wasn't actually an approach to IBM, but you know, their attitude is, well, it'd be pointless to have the patent if we let all of our for-profit competitors use it, and you know, we wanted to be out there. And, and so I can understand where they're coming from, but it's kind of a pain. Okay, um, so that's up to now is all the things that are the short-term type locks. Locks that uh, you can only hold uh, for a short-term basis. You can't hold them on a long-term basis. Now we'll start into the locks that are the long-term locks. The fastest and simplest of these is the shared exclusive locks. And unsurprisingly, they provide shared and exclusive access. Uh, you can specify that you can recurse. Uh, you can also uh, indicate that uh, if a signal comes in while you're asleep, you would like to wake up and handle that signal. It has, I'll just say, limited upgrade and downgrade capabilities. Uh, and like all sleep locks, it does not implement priority propagation because it's pointless, as for the reasons I described earlier. You'll still see a lot of people doing explicit sleep and wake up uh, in the system. But uh, it's typically uh, things like demons that are just sort of ping-ponging back and forth. So there'll be like the demon that does swapping or paging or whatever, and it'll go to sleep. And then when whatever, someone decides they need it to run, they issue it to wake up, and it does some stuff for a while, and then it goes back to sleep. And so those sorts of sleep and wake-ups uh, you will see uh, just written as sleep and wake-up. But in the sort of traditional way, for example, the code that I showed you at the very beginning, uh, we wrap all the business about want flags and lock flags and so on, and the sleep and wake up parts inside uh, these condition variable functions. And so uh, you, you'll see it uh, being used in that way, the CV under type uh, stuff. Uh, so it allows you to wait and uh, optionally time out. So you can say, well, I want to sleep, but not longer than five seconds. Uh, or if a signal comes in, I want to be interrupted, or I don't want to be interrupted, whatever. Um, you can say, when you do a wake up, do you want to wake up just one of the, the ones that's waiting, i.e., the one that's been waiting the longest, or do you want to wake everybody up? That's sort of historic behavior. And you have to hold a mutex uh, before awakening or waiting. Uh, and if you're about to wait, uh, the, the mutex is released as part of going to sleep. And I didn't really describe that aspect of it. But if you think about it, you need to get a mutex to check like the want and lock flags and so on. And you don't want that state to be able to change before you get completely to sleep. Because if you, if you release the mutex and then call sleep, between the time you release the mutex and the time you get to sleep, someone else might have run and issued a wake up. But since you haven't gotten to sleep yet, uh, there's no one to wake up, okay, no worries, but now you go to sleep and there's no one that's ever going to issue you a wake up. And remember that forever word which we really don't like. So the, the issue with, with the mutex is you hold the mutex, it's actually passed as a parameter to sleep, and it says when you have gotten to sleep, then release this mutex. And normally then it's reacquired uh, when you wake up, although you can set a flag to sleep and says, eh, I don't really need it when I wake up. Yes, Julian. Okay, well, I will check that, since I want to get the textbook right, of course. Okay, so we finally get to the most full-featured, all-singing, all-dancing lock manager locks. Uh, these are, can, you know, jump through hoops and do all kinds of exciting things. Shared and exclusive access, you can recurse, uh, you can request a timeout or an interrupt by a signal. You can do upgrade, downgrade it, upgrade it, what's called an exclusive upgrade. 
which says, I have this shared lock. I want it to be turned into an exclusive lock. And by the way, I don't want anyone else to get an exclusive lock between when I ask for it and when I get it. And if someone else somehow manages to sneak in and get the exclusive lock before I get it, uh, then you need to let me know that uh, so that I can potentially have to go back and check things again. OK. Uh, was I the ability to pass the ownership of the lock from the thread to the kernel? Uh, and this probably sounds a little bit weird. Why would you want to do that? Uh, the issue here is that normally, if you hold the lock, your thread needs to be the one that releases that lock. And if it's not, if, if like I lock it and one of you unlocks, it's like, oh, now wait a minute. You're not supposed to do that. That's not your lock. That's my lock. Um, however, there are times when I may not even be around anymore by the time it, it needs to be unlocked. So for example, uh, I'm, I'm writing out a bunch of blocks of a file, you know, I sort of close the file and you know, eventually its blocks need to be written out and I initiate those, but I don't actually wait for that I.O. to complete. And in fact, by the time the I.O. is completed, I may be completely exited out of the system and not exist anymore at all. And so now who's going to be able to unlock it? Uh, so what ends up happening is if I'm sort of disowning it, I'm, I'm handing it off to the I.O. system, I turn it over and say, well, I, I disavow knowledge of this. I am not in charge of this anymore. I'm just giving that to the kernel. And now something like the gup thread of geom or the interrupt thread for the device or whatever can be the one that ultimately unlocks that at the end of the, the operation. And that thread is a kernel thread and it's owned by the kernel. So all is happy and we don't get any panics. Uh, we've been deprecating Lock Manager for a decade, but it just has enough uses that it doesn't ever seem to quite go away. Uh, um, and like all sleep locks, it does not uh, implement priority propagation. And also, I think that Lock Manager cannot start uh, normal shared locks. Those locks can share, uh, can uh, start right there. Right? And Lock Manager has some knowledge not to. Yes, yeah, so the, the comment up here is that uh, the, uh, whoops, the reader writer locks here, or the shared exclusive locks here, uh, what can happen is that if there's enough people coming through and using the shared ones, you can starve an exclusive access. Uh, so, because of course you can't have exclusive access until all the shared ones go away. And if we just keep handing out shared ones all the time, uh, you may never get to the point where the exclusive guy gets it. Uh, with the lock manager locks, once there's a pending request for an exclusive lock, we will not allow any more shared locks to come in. And so they will at some point drain away. So we do, in fact, ensure that the exclusive access can happen. The, I mean, it's not like one of those is correct and the other is not correct. They're just different algorithms, and you need to know what they are uh, when you're deciding which kind of lock to use. OK, so how do we make all this stuff work and play well together? Well, in the old days, we used to uh, just sort of know that you, know, you had to have this kind of lock before you had that kind of lock, and what all the correct orders were of everything. And it was all well documented in the comments for the most part when they were up to date and written. Um, and it kind of sort of worked OK it, when we had single threaded kernels. But once we started getting all these mutexes, and you have just an explosion of the number of locks that are in the system, it becomes virtually impossible to really know what the correct ordering is for the locking uh, without getting yourself into deadlock. And deadlock is another one of those situations which is rather unpleasant. Uh, so there's essentially two ways to deal with deadlock. One is, uh, and believe it or not, is the way it was historically done, not in Unix, but in some other operating systems, is to uh, Essentially, have a daemon that watches for deadlocks, and when it sees a deadlock, it just goes, hmm, those two threads are deadlocked. Well, I'll just shoot that one. Poof! Deadlock solved. Uh, unfortunately, if the one that was shot was your Emacs editor that you hadn't saved the buffer for, well, never mind. Um, so, the approach that uh, has been used in Unix since the beginning of time, and still used today, but is now being checked by the witness code, is what's called partial ordering. Uh, and the idea of partial ordering is that we put the locks into classes. So we have 
Uh, class one here is all of the R1 locks. So there's R1 and R1 prime and R1 double prime. And over here in class two, we've got R2 and R2 prime and R2 double prime. And then there's just two very simple rules. You can only have one lock at a time in a class. And you can only acquire a lock in a higher numbered class than the one you already own. So we have two threads here, A and B. And A comes along and uh, gets lock number one here. And thread B comes along and gets lock R2. And so far, that's fine. If you only own one lock, there's no possibility for deadlock. But now, thread A comes along and wants R2. Well, that meets the criterion. It's in a different class. And uh, it's two is higher than one, so that's all fine. But it gets blocked because thread B is holding it. Well, now thread B wants R1 over here. Well, that's, if, if we just, if it just tried to get R1, we'd now be deadlocked because they each hold one and they each want the other one and we'd be stuck. But thread B realizes, oh, R1 is a lowered class, numbered class than the one I already hold. So I can't do that. I have to temporarily give up my R2, then go block on R1 because thread A's already got it. But now thread A is going to be able to get R2, do its thing, and release them. And now thread B will be able to get R1 and then come back and reacquire R2. And everybody's happy and we have no deadlock. Now, as I say, you know, this was just sort of a known thing and everyone sort of knew what the orders were in the old days, but that with the addition of SMP just became untenable. And so the witnessing code came into existence to actually help out with this. Now, absent uh, the algorithm I'm about to describe, someone has to go along and figure out what these classes are and what the ordering is. And uh, while the programmers have some idea of that, it's a little bit tenuous to expect them to do that with every lock in the system. And so, in fact, what happens is, although you can sort of predefine certain classes and what's in those, uh, for the most part, witness just figures it out on its own. Uh, it just sort of comes up and it watches the order in which things are used, and it builds its own notion of uh, what the hierarchy is supposed to be. And then when it sees a violation of that hierarchy, it complains and puts out the, the well-known LOR kind of thing. It's like, you acquired this lock at this line of this function and this other lock at this other line of this other function, and you can't have that one while you hold this one. You gotta, it's got to be the other order. Uh, now, you'd say, well, how can it possibly figure all that out? Well, the answer is that, uh, and get it right, I mean, what if it gets it in the wrong order? Well, first of all, you shouldn't be programming in the wrong order, so the, it should, you know, the right order should be sort of what's there. And it turns out by the time you've gone through the startup code, most of the interesting locks and mutexes have already been created and, so, and been used in the right order. And so witness more or less gets it right. And you only need to do a little bit of strategic uh, identification, pre-identification, and it all just kind of works. That being said, we still end up with a lot of lock order reversals, which in fact may not ever really be a problem. But uh, there's a, the LOR mailing list uh, wherein people spend you know, endless amounts of time debating how best to fix these things. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, it, it is a constant headache. Um, but at least uh, you know that if you're not getting LOR messages, you're not going to be getting deadlocks in the system. And, and one of the, you know, FreeBSD is sort of known as a system that's not prone to deadlocking, unlike some other systems. Uh, and uh, the witness is, is a large piece of why that is. Uh, the witness is also extremely valuable when you're jumping into a piece of code that you haven't worked on for a while or maybe never worked on. And so you don't really know what the order is, but you very quickly, <laughs> it gets pointed out to you, uh, and, and specifically why you're doing things and where the order is wrong. Uh, figuring out how to fix that can often be a little more difficult, uh, but uh, as I say, once you get it fixed, it's fixed, and you just know you're not going to get a deadlock, at least from that. Okay, so that is what I have to say. Um, I had meant to put these slides up, and I meant to do it last night, and I couldn't quite get it to work, so I need to talk to Dan. But I am going to put these slides up uh, on the, the, the wiki or the web page or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, I will have about three minutes for questions. Yeah. So we have the nice where I can run regularly a static analyzer uh, in the base system, uh, which does support annotations for um, acquired before they get to the box. So I have two questions. Has anyone actually applied these annotations um, to any of the kernel stuff? Is 
You can certainly get witness to dump out the state of you know, what, all the ordering rules that it has. Um, John, do you know the answer to the first question there? Update it. <laughs> I'll take yeah, that under, yeah. uh, I'll add it to my to do list here. <laughs> I actually asked the, asked John many, 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 <laughs> yes. Um, the condition variables in the mock manager locks, do these signal or notify the semantics when they're waiting on the result? Um, they are using the wake up primitive in the system. So they, uh, they identify whatever is the thread that should be awakened, and then they issue a wake up to take it off the sleep queue and put it on the run queue. Right. All wake up does is put you on a run queue, and then the scheduler will decide when you get to actually run. It might run straight away if it's pre CPU. Right. Okay. Anything else? Ha. I've stunned them all into silence. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And